Hello everyone, I'm Giacomo Susani, I'm artistic director of the festival Omenache here in Padova. We are now at the end of the festival uh, after a fantastic week of events. I'm here with wonderful composer and guitarist Stephen Goss, uh, who has been here for the entire week and it was amazing to have him here with us. Um, Steve, uh, you've taken part in a lecture conference with mm -hmm. Lucian Bogdanovich uh, earlier on in the festival and among the topics there was one that was extremely um, interesting and important in my opinion which was uh, for performers um, to seek the experience of improvising and uh, experimenting with composing themselves to enrich their experience as, um, as performers. So what do you think about that? Well, I think this is uh, a really important area of uh, sort of music education in general. And rather than the question, you know, um, oh, can we get people to improvise and compose? We, the, the question should really be, why, why did musicians stop improvising and composing? Because for many centuries, every musician would improvise and compose as well as play their instrument. It was part, part of the culture. In fact, even if we look at 19th century um, guitar methods, they have whole sections on partimenti, improvisation, and it was kind of expected that if you could play an instrument, you'd know how harmony worked and how composition worked, basically. Um, that kind of all changed in the 20th century, so now we're trying to kind of reclaim that ground. And I think uh, what was really great about spending time with Dushan and talking about these things in public was just addressing the fact that this uh, that something needs to be done about this. <laughs> you know, we've got to get uh, players back into improvising. And I think one of the nice things about the guitar, because you know, sometimes people come to the classical guitar from folk traditions or rock music or jazz, and in those areas, improvising and composing is an absolutely integral part of, of playing an instrument. And that's very much alive and kicking. So it's very exciting that now this is beginning to kind of um, wash over into, into the kind of classical world because I think we've been too guilty for too long of simply learning our pieces and not really thinking about how they're put together or how we might do that ourselves. So um, how do you think a young player could start improvising or composing if uh, this is something that he or she does not do very often? Mm. There's a kind of stigma attached to both these words, improvisation and, and composition. It's almost as if you, know, you can't call yourself a composer or you can't compose unless you know, you've been through a rigorous composition course for many years. And similarly with improvisation, it's something that doesn't generally happen in, in music lessons, so people are a little bit afraid of it. But I think there are very easy ways to start. Um, for example, you know, uh, if you're playing a piece by a composer of sorts and it, and it begins in a certain way, is to kind of think, okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to play the notes or the rhythms that are on the page, but I'm going to try and then recreate the character or the mood or the atmosphere or even just the sound of how I'd like this piece to open. And I'll just sort of play around with some of the notes. And of course, you know, your improvisations don't have to be profound at this stage. Same with the compositions. The important thing is to start uh, and start, start going. So you think in a way that not necessarily one needs to create immediately, but just being in touch with sound and listening attentively to it and just see where that leads. Exactly. And, um, and also just looking and thinking, well, how is this piece that I'm playing constructed? You know, what are these harmonies? What's going on here? And can I do something with those harmonies? You know, in, in a way that someone who learns you know, half a dozen chords on a steel string guitar will then try and write a song. It's kind of part of that natural process. I'll just use this vocabulary to do this. Um, and also with improvising, one thing that I do when I'm teaching improvisation is give people uh, like a point of focus, the imagination. So you say something like, you know, imagine a beautiful sunset uh, on a Spanish beach. Most people have gone home. It's getting very, very quiet. You can sort of hear the sound of the water coming in on the pebbles, very, very soft. There might be a few bird cries. It's very, very peaceful. There's no one within 100 meters of you, you know, and then just start playing. Yeah, well, this is a very encouraging for people because, I mean, this is something we all share. It's just mm. emotions and feelings and starting mm. from that, everyone can do. Absolutely. Um, I take it that you improvise, you started improvising very early. Yeah, but I mean, again, I was so slightly struck by the, the stigma of it, you know, because the people I knew who were improvisers were the people who were, um, you know, playing jazz or whatever. I've never um, improvised in public, for example. 
Uh, but it's something that's part of uh, the compositional process, it's part of uh, the practice process. When I was playing a lot of concerts, I'd always improvise around the material I was playing and, and mess around with it. Um, and in fact, I think, you know, whenever I did transcriptions or arrangements, um, it was just too tempting for me to start changing things and moving things in a different direction, which comes from a kind of improvisational base. Yeah, well, you just mentioned transcription, which I guess is a very important topic as well. Mm -hmm. And this particular thing you just said of start to transcribe in something, but then take it to another mm -hmm. uh, place, that's probably a very good idea to, uh, to start creating a little bit. Although, uh, maybe without pushing it too far, but trying to adapt it to the idiom of the instrument uh, in uh, even changing a few things. Do you think is, that is something valuable for people to, to do? Oh, absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. And other things too, like, you know, for example, taking a folk song and either arranging it for an instrument or a voice plus guitar or for guitar solo and thinking, okay, it's got these chords, these are the chords you'd normally harmonize it with. It with. Maybe I could change a note in this chord, or add a couple of notes to that chord, or change this other chord. And it's just this idea of experimenting. So, improvisation doesn't have to be something you do in real time with a beat going. Um, it can be just sort of playing with material and, and just looking at it from different uh, perspectives and, and saying, okay, can, can I push this stuff in a different direction? Yeah, this is very fascinating because eventually it can lead to. Uh, just a very rich and varied repertoire and you mm. could have an, a practical outcome which is to actually play the eventually these things that you have experienced uh, in concert or in front mm. of someone and, and this is probably something we need, you know, some, a, a new take or some new ideas uh, to share with the audience. I think it's really great when people like Dusan Bogdanovic and when he was still with us, Roland Dion's, starting their concerts with improvisations. Mm. Um, and just bringing this, uh, or perhaps, you know, instead of starting a piece straight away, playing a little prelude before it. And, and Dusha made a fantastic point in his uh, talk about the idea you can start improvising simply by deciding a different order for your program, yeah. or thinking of ways of playing. Sean, when he started his concert, he started with a very short piece of Harrison Burgos, or uh, the White Hand, and, um, and went, that went straight into um, says La Cathedral, so it kind of acted as a prelude, which made a really wonderful musical juxtaposition. So it's this kind of creative programming which is already um, you're coming into that world of improvisation. Yeah, so there are different levels of improvisation so, uh, with timing, with programming, as you said, with uh, depending on the whole, even just reacting to silence, mm -hmm. to the response of the audience. So it's not just purely dealing with sound or the instrument. Exactly. I mean, you make a very good point there that actually, as, a, as players, we should all be preparing um, a continuum of different possible interpretations of any piece we learn. Um, you know, we should be able to play the piece very, very slowly and very, very fast, because if you play in a very dry acoustic and there's a bit of background noise or whatever, then you're going to have to play quicker than if you're in a cathedral where there's a lot of resonance and so on. So getting used to practicing at a range of tempos, also a different range of dynamics, articulations, means you can then improvise those things in a performance situation. You don't, you know, improvisation isn't just stuck to pitches and rhythms. Uh, it can also just be to do with uh, agogic accents, articulations, dynamics, tempo, these other parameters. Yeah, well, this is fantastic because in a way, music becomes suddenly extremely flexible and malleable and. Uh, and not something fixed or in, or framed into into something that needs to be reproduced or an ideal version of it. Exactly. I remember talking to uh, Zoran Dukic about this once, and he said when he's on stage and he's about to start, he thinks, "What speech should I start?" You know, and it, it's just born in that moment, um, rather than you know uh, sticking to a, a very particular sort of tightrope walk kind of approach. Uh, one which allows much more sort of width and variety. Yeah, uh, and then uh, also in this way, the relationship to the score, which is a very important point, I guess, uh, for everyone, and especially young people, becomes mm. also, uh, in a way, easier, but in a good way, it becomes an actual relationship, a dialogue. It's not just something that you try to reproduce, but it's something you interact with. And I think this is probably very helpful and healthy for a young player to have in mind. Absolutely, you've hit the nail on the head there, Jack. Right? Absolutely, it's the idea that um, you know we've become so obsessed with 
the score as, as a kind of almost like a sacred text, that we almost treat it with, uh, with too much um, uh, reverence, really. And actually the idea being that, you know, what a composer's done is put a version of a piece onto paper and as a starting point for someone to do something creative and musical. Um, and the idea that, you know, you take a piece and you learn the piece and you, you look at all the things, all the markings in the score, but then you take it to yourself and you think, okay, that's my starting point. What else can I do? Well, how else could this piece work? Um, one of the things that I really enjoy about being a composer is that sometimes you'll hear someone play a piece of yours in a way you hadn't even considered, you know, a, a different tempo, a different kind of character, a different thing, and this is, this is very exciting because it means the music is being completely rejuvenated on a regular basis, rather than trying to, you know, so it becomes a, a butterfly that's flying free rather than uh, one of the ones you see with formaldehyde on it, with a <laughs> pinned onto a board. Yeah. So you welcome change. You you welcome. Uh, new ideas as a composer. I do. I mean, I'm not speaking for all composers. Yeah, of course. Uh, there are there are very different. You know, there are probably as many different approaches to composition as there are composers. Um, you know, I come at composing basically from a player's perspective. So that you know, playing my own work is, is kind of how I started, uh, and I think that's sort of quite different from other more conceptual composers or people who are very very fussy about the tiniest detail. There's there's a range of approaches, um, but I think you know in terms of people deciding whether to start improvising or composing, I think the important thing is, is just to go, to do it. And probably the place to start as a composer is to start by improvising preludes to a piece. So say you're going to play a piece, uh, well, by any composer, well, for example, La, La, La Cathedral um, uh, that we heard the other night from Sean. Uh, he chose to put Burt as a piece before it, but he could have improvised his own piece, could have written his own piece as a prelude that goes straight into it. And that's a really good place to start at. Yeah, so I guess what is very important probably to say is that it's, it's not to hold back, mm. to just start, and even if it's someone feels what he's doing is not great yet, then just keep doing it because by working you, exp you have more experience and you find things out, while if you just don't do it because you're afraid, you're never going to have the experience. Exactly, and that feedback loop is very, very useful. So, so if you've done something that really is quite shockingly bad, Someone will tell you and you'll go, okay, well, next time I'll do it differently. Mm. And I think as, as players, we always have to kind of push the extremes, find out where the limits are. Uh, and then once we've found out where the limits are, just take one step back rather than ten steps back. Well, this is great. I think there is a lot of food for thought there. So thank you so much, Steve. My pleasure. Thank you, Jen. And it was great to have you here at the festival. And oh. I'm sure I'll see you next year if you want to come. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>